NFL Show on the Grizzly True Sports Network. The NFL Show is brought to you by BetNow.eu. Make sure you go to BetNow.eu. Use the promo code TRUTH100 to get a 100% cash back bonus on your first deposit. I am your co-host for the NFL Show, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome in from the FF Faceoff, Anthony Servino. How you doing, Anthony? I'm doing awesome, Mike. How are you? Uh, I'm a Bengals fan, so I'm pretty much numb to everything. Well, at least you didn't lose to Teddy Bridgewater. We lost to Mason Rudolph. That might be worse. Plus, the Cincinnati Bengals last night, their 27-3 loss made Mason Rudolph look like the second coming of Tom Brady. 24 for 28, 229 yards, two touchdowns, no interceptions. And, of course, the Steelers couldn't run the ball until they played the Bengals. So what was your takeaway on this pathetic performance by the Bengals? You know, it was just a bad game all the way around. But the key for me and the key really to the Bengals is the fact that they can't protect Andy Dalton. And Andy Dalton takes a lot of heat uh, that's not deserved. You know, when you're getting sacked eight or nine times, you even saw the frustration. Andy Dalton was not happy in the second half uh, after one of those last sacks. Um, And that's really setting the Bengals back. And I think they have a lot of talent. They have a lot of young talent on this team. They just can't protect them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, losing that uh, first-round pick uh, tackle, it really uh, set them back more than I thought they would be. I don't think it did because they would still need four other linemen, and they don't have any right now. Um, the sad thing here is when you look at them, they made the coaching change. They bring in Opie Taylor, and he sucks. I, the thing I get is – his play calling is bad. He, but he, how do you put it on him when there's no protection to execute? Because he is the one that decided to keep Bobby Hart and to bring back Andre Smith. No, uh, your general manager did. Uh, no, because what we are told in Cincinnati is now Zach Taylor has final say on that. So, And there is no general manager, remember, in Cincinnati. It's just an owner, his daughter... And a guy named Duke Tobin that they try to act like makes all the decisions, but he doesn't. So, I'm sorry. There's ways to call an offense around a bad offensive line. And he has no clue what he's doing. I mean, this staff is overwhelmed. They're young. And they talked about Taylor being an offensive mind at the start, and that's fine. But it doesn't translate on the field. He's lost when it comes to compensating for poor offensive line play, especially on I mean, his screen calls are, like, idiotic. Because right now, with no blocking at all, nothing's going to work. Lou Anarumo, who was the defensive coordinator, first time he's ever been one, is in bad looks constantly. And it doesn't matter what the offense shows. He lines up poorly. The tackling is an issue. And miscommunication is uncommonly bad here. And... I'll go back to our Cincinnati Bengals weekly show, which I did with Joe Kelly, who played in the 88 AFC Championship Bengals, and he said that he talked to Preston Brown, Preston Brown's father, and this is right before the season started, and he said that the linebackers don't know what the DBs are doing, the DBs don't know what the linebackers are doing, and the miscommunication is rampant because this team is just poorly coached. And when you sit here and you tell me that you have this talent, They do at skill positions, and they have more talent than teams that are winning games right now. So if they have more talent, I mean, the New York Giants offensive line is not very good. They're 2-2. Their their offensive line is a lot better than it was in the past. It's it's still bad. They're worse now than what they were at the end of last year, I think. I mean, Daniel Jones, Eli Manning get the hell beat out of them all the time. But the thing is this, when you've got all this talent offensively, but you never worried about the offensive line, you can't tell me that at some point the head coach can't go to the owner and say, hey, I can't run an offense without people blocking for my quarterback. It's going to be tough. Um, The good thing, if there's any consolation, is that Cordy Glenn could be coming back soon. Well, good for Cordy Glenn, but Cordy Glenn's not very good either. Plus, he gets hurt all the time. He'll be hurt in a couple weeks, and he'll be out again. A.J. Green isn't saving this. I mean, his presence might create more room for the running game, but it's not going to help the line block for longer than a second. 
I mean, Andy if, Dalton. Andy Dalton got sacked eight times last night, and it was amazing to me to watch these dumbass Bengals fans post about how we need Ryan Finley in. And I like Ryan Finley. You know, I'm one that before the Bengals even drafted him, I thought Finley was the best quarterback in this draft. But if you put him in there right now, he's going to get the hell beat out of him. You're going to ruin him for the future. And this team right now is a joke. The best thing, and I've said it on this show, I've said it on my show, the best thing the Bengals can do is get something for A.J. Green. There's no need to retain A.J. Green and put him in for the last, you know, half a season. There's no need to re-sign him because I don't think he's going to re-sign in Cincinnati anywhere. You know, he uh, he's a Super Bowl away from a Hall of Fame player. I don't know if he's first ballot, but he's definitely in the conversation. So why stay in Cincinnati and continue to lose uh, during, you know, a Zach Taylor rebuild when, you know, the Patriots, they need a wide receiver. Yeah. That offense receiver. didn't exactly look like a dominant offense against the Bills. Well, you have some guys banged up, too, but I agree with you. You put A.J. Green in New England. I mean, AJ there's Green a reason why they signed, a, they, they, they signed Antonio Brown because they needed a receiver. Yeah. So, you know, what if, you know, what if Devontae Adams and his turf toe lingers? They need a receiver in Green Bay. So get a third or a fourth round pick for A.J. Green. Well, you and, can get more than a third or fourth round pick for A.J. Green, I think. He's a 30-year-old receiver. Yeah. I But you have desperate teams that need wide receivers, too. I mean, yeah, that's true. When Golden Tate went for, like, a fourth last year, you're right. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the thing. Both teams are desperate. You might be able to get something out of it. I'm sure the Bengals won't do that because that's not something the Bengals do do. And my question right now, are the Bengals worse than the Dolphins? Because, to me, that looks like a – Tantalizing matchup that could end in a six to three war in, in a few weeks. Do they play each other? Yeah, they play each other. <laughs> uh, that is going to be hell to watch. Every Bengals game is hell to watch. And the thing is, once again, you go back to the game against Seattle, poor coaching decisions cost them that game. Um, the game they played, what was it, last week against Buffalo? Poor coaching decisions cost them the game. The lack of having timeouts at the end of games. The poor undisciplined play, you can't blame on the GM. The poor undisciplined play goes to Zach Taylor. And the other thing is this. When you have a coach that doesn't demand respect, this is what you get. And I think the NFL on a whole, by going with the younger guys, has brought guys in that have a different mentality than what an older coach would have. Well, here, here's a question. With these young head coaches, do you think there's an issue with respect from some of the veteran players who are like, hey, I'm older than you, or, uh, you know? Not, no, because Bill Cowher commanded respect. You know, there's been young coaches. Don Shula commanded respect back in the 60s. But the thing was, those guys were brilliant. So I don't think it matters how old the head coach is. What I think matters is how much that head coach knows and can that head coach make you better as a football player and a football team. And right now, when we listen to Booger McFarland, which right there, when a grown man goes by the name of Booger, I lose a lot of respect <laughs> right there. And I don't think Booger's that bad on TV. It's better than listen to John Gruden talk about himself. But when Booger McFarland says this team's headed in the right direction, He's a, he sounds like a flaming idiot because there's no way in any world this team is headed in the right direction. This is a team that, what, three or four years after the 2015 season when they may have been the best team in the NFL, but they lost Andy Dalton. They let Mohamed Sanu go. They let Marvin Jones go. And then the next year, they're letting Kevin Zeitler and Andrew Whitworth go. Now, Jones and Sanu, I don't care as much. They're wide receivers. They're kind of a dime a dozen. But you let one of the best tackles, one of the best guards in football leave your team. And I don't think it's any coincidence that since that's happened, they haven't even sniffed the playoffs. And to blame Andy Dalton is stupid. To blame anything, anybody but Mike Brown, Katie Blackburn, Duke Tobin, and what, Opie Taylor, I think it's stupid. Because once again, what we have with head coaches in the NFL now are, is not a hard-nosed mentality. It's we want to spread the ball out. We want to throw the ball around. 
But still, predominantly, teams that win the Super Bowl, like the Patriots or the Eagles a couple of years ago, are teams that will line up behind a big offensive line and run the ball down your throat. They'll throw it when they feel like throwing it. And today, it's more of we run the ball as an afterthought. Uh, we talked about it yesterday with McVay. They threw the ball 68 times, and they have Todd Gurley in the back. Yeah, but it, five I, times. I think there's an issue with Todd Gurley, though. Um, you know, Gurley had a big game catching passes, but if you look at his yards per carry outside of week one, it's been on the decline. The Rams, if we're going to go to the Rams, they need to establish the run. I just don't know if Todd Gurley's the guy. Yeah, but how about um, this? Todd Gurley's the kind of running back that gets better the more he touches the ball. But what about the knee? What if the knee is an actual issue? Well, then you run Malcolm Brown. But the point is this. You have to be able to run the ball to win the Super yeah, Bowl. Yeah, I, I agree. I 100% agree with that. I mean, is there a team that has won a Super Bowl that was a 70-30 pass to run team? Uh, I would uh, I would have to go back and look, but I doubt it. Yeah, and if you look at probably the three greatest offenses we've seen in the last 30 years, you got, what, the 98 Vikings, who lost to a team that had Jamal Anderson running the ball on them. You had the Buffalo Bills team, which lost to a Giants team with a backup quarterback, but a badass offensive line, and Otis Anderson, who was playing like he was 25 again. And then you had the Rams' greatest show on turf. And the thing about it is, the Rams' greatest show on turf, the year before that, or two years before that, won the Super Bowl. Why'd they win the Super Bowl? Because they handed the ball to Marshall Falk. When they lost the Super Bowl two years later, it's because Marshall Falk only touched the ball 15 times. And they played against the New England Patriots team that basically just ran the ball and played defense. So I think what people are missing here, you can get all the young guys that know how to play Madden really well, but they're almost always going to lose to a team that is physical because uh, I've never seen a team get out hit and lose a game. And I think that the NFL as a whole is getting away from that, and it's turned in more to this pinball type of football crap. But in the end, as long as there's a handful of teams that are willing to run the ball and smack you in the mouth, they're usually going to win, and we saw that in the Super Bowl last year. Well, yeah, because that's what matters when it gets colder out and the the weather becomes a factor and it becomes more difficult to throw. You have to establish the run. You have to run the football. It's not even that. It's a mentality. The mentality is, I'm going to kick your ass. Now, the mentality today through a lot of these young coaches is not, I'm going to kick your ass. It's, I'm going to outsmart you. And the thing is, when I was in school, my teachers would always tell me, even my history teacher, they said, violence never solves anything. But if you read any history book, you'll find out that 99.9% of the time, violence solved pretty much every problem there ever was. <laughs> it's funny, but it's true. I mean, and, and the, the Revolutionary War, you know, we couldn't just go up to England and try to outsmart them and say, hey, why don't you stop taxing us? No, we had to, you know, go hide in trees while they walked in a straight line, and we shot them all. So... Uh, violence solves everything in football. And if you're the more violent team, you're going to win. And right now, that is disappearing. And it's why I think it's been so easy for Bill Belichick to continue to win. Because Bill Belichick basically will use running back by committee. He'll, he's got the best offensive line coach in the NFL. And his defenses play smash mouth football. And these, you know... Four and five wide receiver sets don't work. It's like Steve Spurrier, 96 NCAA football championship. He's got the Florida Gators in his fun and shoot or run and fun, whatever the hell he called it, offense that was averaging almost 60 points a game. They played Nebraska. Nebraska stuck seven guys in the box and just went after their ass and brutalized them like 66 to 24 because there's only one way to win in football. That's right now because 10 years from now, Everybody may be, you know, wearing, you know, tutus and running around tossing the ball around all the time. But as long as there's guys that are willing to smack you in the face, those guys are usually going to win. The Chicago Bears are 3-1 and one with freaking Mitchell Trubisky and Chase Daniels at quarterback because on defense, they smack you in the mouth. Well, that's, you know, Khalil Mack is the uh, best defensive player in football. Well, right and they've now. got more than Khalil Mack on that defense, though. That defense is really good. No, that they do. But Khalil Mack is the one that brought it all together last season. 
Well, yeah, he's the one that put him over the top, just similar to Reggie White going to Green Bay. You know, because you had Brett Favre, but you didn't really have a great running game. But once you got Reggie White, Reggie White brought a mentality to that team. And once you have the mentality as being, you know, tough, you can overcome anything. But, I mean, I don't think anybody's ever going to say that the L.A. Rams, even with a good defense, they're not a tough team. No, no, they're not. And their good defense got exposed. Yeah, and you know why they're not a tough team? Because they're coached by a 12-year-old, much like Opie Taylor coaches the Cincinnati Bengals. So, the other question is this. The Steelers are only one game behind the Browns and Ravens. Do you take them seriously now, or is it just, just because they played the Cincinnati Bengals, who are as soft as butter? I need to see them uh, win against a viable opponent. Before I can buy into Mason Rudolph and, and everything else that's going on in Pittsburgh. Because they didn't look too good uh, without Big Ben up until yesterday. All right. We have a question from Steeler Jeff in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania through Twitter, which you can send us messages there. You can also call us, but I can't remember the number right now. They didn't write it down. So just send us a message on Twitter. Steeler Jeff wants to know, since Anthony picked the Bengals to win last night, are the Bengals just not a viable opponent now because he was wrong about them? Well, so what? Just because I picked the Steelers, uh, the Bengals to win? Yeah, because yeah. he says that does that make them now no longer a viable opponent? But going into last night, you thought that they would beat the Steelers. So now. That's because they had the better quarterback. Okay. Let, yeah. Let's get that straight. Andy Dalton's a better quarterback right now than Mason Rudolph. Well, yeah, and the question is with Mason Rudolph, he's still not really throwing the ball down the field a whole hell of a lot, and the Bengals have no running game. I wouldn't read too much into this. I think the Steelers here, are still you, done. Here, here, still, uh, go beat Baltimore next week, and then we'll talk about uh, the Steelers making a run. Yeah, but then if they beat Baltimore, they're just making a run because the AFC North sucks really bad. I mean, they listen. They they the Steelers. You got Baltimore. You got the Chargers, Dolphins, Colts. It's not like they they can't turn this around. They have a a, a winnable schedule down the stretch. You got the Bengals again, uh, Arizona, the Jets. Yeah, but I still think when you look at this roster, I, I don't think there's enough weapons there. I think Baltimore and Cleveland are still both better teams than the Steelers. I think the Steelers are a five- or a six-win team at best. I think it's all going to come down on the defense. If the Steelers' defense can really pull together and uh, carry this team and Mason Rudolph plays just well enough to keep him above water, you know, nine and seven can win this division. Yeah, but I don't think the defense is there to do that. I think they were just playing the Cincinnati Bengals offense last night. At least that's the way I would take it. So we, we've seen nothing this season to think that the defense could carry them. Because I'm not saying the defense can't be good, but what you're talking about is the defense being dominant, correct? Yeah, and, and Minka Fitzpatrick, you know, he's a big difference maker. Yeah, he's a damn good player. But the rest of the DBs are not very good. All right, let's go talk about your Cowboys. Since the Cowboys, you know, embarrassed themselves Sunday night. The Bengals embarrassed themselves Monday night. We might as well continue to talk about it. Um, Tyron Smith looks like he will play this week, correct? Um, that's not what I heard. Maybe, uh, let, let me pull him up. I thought he was going to be at least ruled out for this I'm week. I'm unlikely. Unlikely. I missed a word. So, You know, he was initially diagnosed with a high ankle sprain, which can keep him out for a while, but they're saying now he might only miss the game against Green Bay and could come back a little bit sooner. Yeah, they said he is... They said it's not a typical high ankle sprain. So where do the Packers play the Cowboys at? Um, In Dallas, and most likely without Devontae Adams, which puts Dallas at a big advantage. Michael Gallup has not been ruled out yet. So, uh, you know, the Cowboys could be getting their speed at receiver back. Yeah, and I think the question is, is the Packers' defense really that good? 
I mean, considering what the Eagles were able to do, especially Jordan Howard, you have Ezekiel Elliott coming off of a bad game. I, I, I think uh, Ezekiel Elliott's going to want to redeem himself. And I think the Cowboys as a whole, they have to redeem himself. You know, these are two, three, and one teams coming off bad losses. Um, there's a lot to play for here. Yeah. And another team who just came off, not necessarily a bad loss, but a game that they had a chance to win, were the Buffalo Bills, who lost their starting quarterback, Josh Allen. And it looks like they're going to prepare Matt Barkley to start versus the Titans. That's kind of big because, you know, Josh Allen, for as many mistakes as he makes, he can also bring that team back. I think Matt Barkley changes the game plan a little bit for the Buffalo Bills because he's more of a game manager, and you have to run the ball a little bit more. And I don't know if Matt Barkley is going to take those chances that uh, that Josh Allen makes, and that can either be good or bad. Yeah, because that he doesn't that take be, those same chances. It could be good because how many teams have we seen that were predominantly a defensive team that win with a quarterback is just what they call a game manager. The Titans aren't a slouch opponent, though, either. Mm, sometimes they are. They're kind of iffy. Uh, it's according to what Marcus Mariota we get. If you get the good Marcus Mariota, I think the Bills are going to have their hands full. If you get the bad Marcus Mariota, he's going to throw the ball to the Bills three times. They'll put him in short fields, and the Bills will get the win. So you still like the Bills, even with the backup quarterback? Didn't say that. We'll find that out Friday, as long as I don't forget and think it's Thursday um, when we pick all the games. So I, I do think it's possible here in this situation that with Buffalo's defense against Marcus Mariota, Mariota is a guy that very rarely strings together good games. So against this defense, I think it may not matter. And if Matt Barkley just doesn't make mistakes, it may give him a better chance. Because you might have Mariota going off throwing three picks. Josh Allen may do the same damn thing and make the game competitive. So. Yeah, well, the the thing I'm watching here is the Titans, I believe, are going to get Taylor Lewan back. And he's either going to, re, you know, he's going to help this offensive line. But let's see if it also helps the offensive line in terms of pass blocking for Mariota. Because if Lewan's the missing piece, Mariota looked pretty good last week. You know, then you can start taking the Titans a little bit serious. Yeah, and I, I would think that the question here also is this. The Titans are coming off a big win. The Bills are coming off a very tough loss. How does that win and that loss affect these two teams? Because mentally, that may be what decides this game in the end. I think this is going to be a low-scoring game to begin with. And Derrick Henry and whoever the Bills have at running back, uh, they're going to be getting a lot of carries. Because I don't trust the quarterback on either side. Could be 73-year-old Frank Gore making the difference in this one. And what's the status on Devin Singletary? Have you heard anything there? I mean, he was close to playing last week, so he could be uh, ready for a return. Yeah, so if you got Singletary and Gore... The tandem there, I think, makes them a lot more dangerous. Um, let's go to Washington, where Jake Gruden isn't ready to name a starter for Week 5 against the New England Patriots. It's probably because neither one of them want to play against the New England Patriots. Of course, he yanked Case Keenum in Sunday's loss to the New York Giants after the signal caller was wholly inaccurate, completing 6 of 11 passes for 37 yards with an interception, took one sack. They brought in Dwayne Haskins who looked, for lack of a better term here, overwhelmed, Anthony. Yeah, Haskins didn't look good, and he wasn't exactly playing a powerhouse defense, and now you're going to put him out there against the New England Patriots. So uh, good luck with that. Yeah, you can't do that. And the problem with him is he holds onto the ball too long. He did it in college also. I don't think he's ever going to be a very good NFL quarterback. If I was Jay Gruden, I would stick with Case Keenum, but he really backed himself in a corner by bringing Dwayne Haskins in. Like I, I, I think we talked about this yesterday. I don't think that was a Jay Gruden call. I think that that came from the top. You think Daniel Snyder just called down during the game? Maybe Absolutely. he's on well, headsets. Not, maybe not during the game, but you know, leading into the game. Yeah, 
So I, I think the Redskins have a mess. And right now the Redskins would be one of the teams, I think, that will fire their coach when the season's over. I think that's a safe one to say, isn't it, Anthony? I mean, all it takes is one win with Daniel Snyder. To do what? To 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 give uh, uh, John Jay Gruden another three year contract. That would be awesome if he did, because I always like to see it when a guy is getting paid and not doing anything. I mean, he's been there for a while and they haven't done anything. No, I mean Daniel Snyder's the guy that brought back Joe Gibbs, and Joe Gibbs couldn't even fix it. That's because of the problem is Daniel Snyder. I know. That was my point too. So the question is, who's the worst owner, Daniel Snyder or Mike Brown? Ooh, I think Snyder. you got to go with Mike Brown just because the amount of years he's sucked. But, uh, you know, at least he's been to a Super Bowl in the 80s. No, he Mike hasn't. Brown just... No, he hasn't. Paul Brown to, went to the Super Bowl. Oh, okay. Paul Brown died in August of 1991. The Cincinnati Bengals have not won a playoff game since. Oh, well, okay. So then uh, I still say Daniel Snyder, but Hmm. just because I don't like Daniel Snyder. Well, see, I really hate Mike Brown. I don't like Daniel Snyder either, though. What do you think about the Falcons trade with the Eagles, Cyprian for Riley? I think it's a move that helps both teams out in weak areas. But, you know, how, how significant is this move going to be? Especially for the Falcons. Yeah. And in the other one that I just saw here, and Bradley Chubb has a partially torn ACL on his left knee and will miss the rest of the season. I would say this is a huge loss for the Broncos, but I think it just, they were done anyways. Yeah, the Broncos aren't going anywhere. And this is going to be a wash season. So losing Chubb, it's significant, but... You know, significant for a one and three or an zero and four team, whatever the hell they are. All right, you got anything else you want to talk about before we wrap it up, Anthony? No, I think we got all the major news and and, and stories of the day. There's really not much out yet. Yeah, and we get to talk about the great Cincinnati Bengals. So, see, whatever you're a Cowboys fan, you've always got the Cincinnati Bengals you can look down on. Well, that's a positive. Not for me. But, all right, tell everybody where they can find you, Anthony. You can follow me on Twitter, at The Real NFL Guru. You can follow my show, at The FF Faceoff. Um, and also, you can get my podcast, The FF Faceoff, anywhere you get your podcast, and on YouTube. All right, guys. I want to remind everybody, you can hear me and Anthony every day at noon on the NFL show. Tomorrow, Sam Teets will be in with his quarterback power rankings. He just sent him to me a while ago. I haven't looked at him yet, but I'm sure we'll be picking that apart. He's probably got Andy Dalton like 57th now. And he's only ranking 32. <laughs> but so Sam Teets will be here tomorrow at noon. Make sure you check us out then. Um, we will have a call-in number for you guys. Check it out on Twitter early in the morning or late tonight if you want to call in and talk to Sam. His power rankings, quarterback power rankings, will be up. About 9, 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow morning. So make sure you check us out right there. Um, you can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you find podcasts. You'll find The Grueling Truth. And don't forget, tonight at 10 o'clock Eastern, we will have the NFL Pick'em Show, which Anthony's afraid to come on and embarrass himself. Oh, it's just right around my bedtime. Oh, whatever. You got to come on tonight because Matt Andrews Cabbage can't make it on and we need somebody to fill in. We'll talk. We'll see. That's Anthony's word for no. He's got to go to bed. Uh, All right, guys. So, for Anthony Servino, I'm Mike Goodpastor. You've been listening to The Grueling Truth, where the legends speak.